So hello and welcome everyone. My name is Susan. I am the program manager at the Muse Writers Center. We are a creative writing nonprofit based in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, and we offer all sorts of fun uh, things. We've got classes for all genres, all ages, all experience levels. Everything is currently on Zoom, so be sure to check it out. Uh, we have a tuition assistance program too. We aim to turn no one away regardless of ability to pay. We also host literary events like this one on a regular basis. So look at our events calendar as well for what's coming up. We have outreach programs for youth, senior and military as well. Um, so definitely take a peek. I've put our website in the chat if you're here on Zoom. Uh, and thank you all so much for joining us again, whether you're joining live in Zoom, if you're watching the Facebook live stream or if you're watching after the fact. If you are watching live either in Zoom or on Facebook, keep in mind that there will be a Q&A portion afterwards. If you're in Zoom, if you look down in the bottom control panel, there's an option that says Q&A. So if you have any questions at any point during the reading, go ahead and pop them in there. And if you're watching live on Facebook, you can put them in the comment section on the live stream. We'll be checking that as well. Um, and we will go ahead and get into things uh, here to introduce our author and reader today is Diane Fine. And I will pass it over to her. Thank you so much. Oh, I don't want to walk, look at myself. Okay, that's better. <laughs> Thank you and welcome to this wonderful event um, put on by the Muse and Norfolk Arts. And um, my name is Diane Fine and I'm an instructor here at the Muse Writers Center, as well as a professor at Old Dominion University, both located in Norfolk, Virginia. And I'd like to welcome you and tell you that we put the um, link to Marissa's wonderful book, in the chat and oh, she put it again. Thank you, Susan. And also a link to the Muse. Um, we believe in supporting local independent booksellers and not giant evil retailers. So if you could buy it through um, bookshop.org, that would be ideal or order it from your local book, independent bookseller in your town it would be fabulous. Um, and also I wanted to note that you can put your questions in the chat um, down on the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a Q&A thing, or you can just do the chat um, and I will see it and ask your questions after Marissa reads and I ask a few questions. So I would like to introduce Marissa now. Marissa Silver is a fantastic writer of literary fiction whose works include Little Nothing, which was a New York Times editor's choice and winner of the 2017 Ohioana Book Award for Fiction. Mary Coyne, a New York Times bestseller and winner of the Southern California Independent Booksellers Award and an NPR and BBC Best Book of the Year. The God of War, a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for Fiction and Babe in Paradise, a New York Times Notable Book of the Year and a Los Angeles Times Best Book of the Year. Her short fiction has won the O. Henry Prize and has appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic and many other publications and has been included in the Best American Short Stories, the O. Henry Prize Stories, as well as other anthologies. In 2017, Marissa received a Guggenheim Fellowship for Fiction, and in 2018, she was awarded the Mary Ellen Vonder Hayden Fellowship at the Dorothy and Lewis B. Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library. She teaches at the MFA Program for Writers at Warren Wilson College in Asheville, North Carolina, not too far from here. Um, so thank you, Marissa, so much for being here this evening. You're I welcome. really appreciate your taking time to do this, and I'm super excited to share your book with uh, the people joining in, and it's called The Mysteries. It's wonderful, and I'd love to start with the reading, if you didn't mind. Absolutely. First of all, thank you for having me, and I'm so delighted to be here at the Muse and beyond the Muse in the world of YouTube. Um, and it's great to talk with you, Diane. Um, I'll start uh, reading just from the beginning of the book. And I'm just going to read a brief uh, a bit because I think the Zoom reading is different from the in-person reading and it can be deadly. <laughs> so I'll just read a little bit to give you a taste of, of the book. Um, so this is chapter one. They are running. There is no reason to go slow. They run out of Mickey's bedroom, down the stairs, through the living room, skipping over the albums that lie scattered across the floor. Mickey nimbly avoids Brubeck, Evans, and Monk, but she wants to crush them too, 
to hear the satisfying snap of the records under her kids, to feel the momentary pulse of destruction. No, her mind says, why not? Because no, her mother would say sharply, Jean's reactions are one part anger and two parts fear. The fault between those feelings align Miggy's senses in the quaver of misgiving that passes across her mother's face when she wants to reprimand her daughter. It is a line Miggy can't resist treading the same way she must trouble a loose tooth, the sharp pain and dull tickle equally irresistible. Who are you? Her mother asked after Miggy shattered the back window of the station wagon with a rock or drew a butterfly on the living room rug because a rock so dense in the hand had to be flung and a magic marker its tip as wet as a dog's nose had to draw. I am Miggy, she said. But of course, her mother knew that. The words mother and father don't exist without the word Miggy. She is the reason for them. I am Miggy, she declares now as she dances around the albums, imagining them as lily pads, imagining herself as a fairy so light she can land on the water between the pads and not drown. Or maybe the albums are the water and the space between are leaves the size of elephant feet because everything is always itself and the inside out of itself. A shirt, a lie, vomit, a dream. I am Ellen, Ellen says more quietly, because this is not her house. These are not her father's records. Those are not her parents' empty tumblers sitting on the coffee table where water rings and cigarette burn marks are branded into the wood. But even, uh, will you stop for just one minute, Jean always says. But even when Miggy tries as hard as she can to stand still, something inside her sparks like the telephone wire that whipped across the street during last winter's ice storm, spitting electricity into the frigid air. She bursts with a desire to move, to speak, to sing, because there is so much. There is so much all the time that even if she could spread her arms wider than the universe, she still could not hold it all. There are the mosquito bites that she is not supposed to scratch. There are starbursts of blood on her arms and shins because she can't help it. There is knowing that she, what she is supposed to do and not doing it, and knowing how she is supposed to do, misbehave and misbehaving. It makes her skin prickle. It makes her choose a great popsicle, but then wish she'd chosen red so that her lips would be painted in defiance of her mother, who says that makeup is not for children. Her rage at the injustice overcomes her. She is mad at the popsicles and mad at her mother, who always says, choose one. But how and why? Wonderful. Thank you so much. That's excellent. I love that book so much. Okay. And um, I absolutely did. I, I, I had so much. Um, well, I'll tell you something interesting. I actually was reading um, Ricky Lee Jones has a an autobiography and I was reading it before this. And then I ended up reading them sort of at the same time. And they really kind of interestingly reflected each other. Ricky Lee Jones grew up a little bit earlier, more like in the late 60s, mid 60s, late 60s. But they really were very, they were about two young, wild, <laughs> untamed horse girls um, who were, you know, running around in the streets. And uh, I really, it really sort of reflected back on each other in a very interesting way. That's so, so funny that you say that about Ricky Lee Jones, because um, the, the sort of weird companion piece to this book in my life was the first film I ever made. Um, I used to be a filmmaker and it's a film called Old Enough, which, and the title I got from a Ricky Lee Jones song called Old Enough. And the, the wow. lyric is, I'm old enough to get what I want and I want you. And, and that has always been this kind of, I don't know, it's the spirit inside of Miggy also. She's old, she feels she's old enough to get what she wants, although she's seven, so she can't get anything. And that's a lot of the, I don't know, the tension that animates her life is her, feeling that she wants control, that she wants to have a kind of um, assertive say over the way things go. And yet she has no power. Exactly. Um, that's Very, that's what enrages her and motivates her. Yeah. You have to read this book then because it's so interesting. And she <laughs> is Little Ricky is like a little Mickey. I mean, I just, all I can say is like, they've so kind of off of each other. Yeah. <laughs> it's called Last Chance Texaco. Okay. Um, and so anyway, so I just found it really wonderful. I'm also the same age as Miggy. So it really spoke to me of the per time period and everything. And I, I just thought it was lovely. And um, we don't want to have spoilers in tonight's presentation. So I'll just say that there is a, 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 a you know, tragic event at the center of this book. And um, it really sort of took my breath away. 
and um, was very surprising. And uh, I just think it's, it's wonderful the way you delve into how this one event affects all the people around it. Um, so I wondered just if you wouldn't mind starting off by talking about where this idea came from, what was the genesis of the story? Sure. Um... I guess, I guess the idea really came from um, something that happened in my father's life. Um, he, in fact, experienced, I, again, we're not going to do spoilers, but he experienced the, the, the tragic incident himself with his mother. Um, and it was something he mentioned to me once in passing when many, many decades ago. And it was never, I didn't, I came from a very, a very warm and loving family, but one in which there wasn't a lot of in-depth psychological discussion of things. So he told me this thing and then and I never heard about it again. And I never really thought about it much, except for when I began to, when I was older and you know, began to have experiences of my own with an adult and with children. And I, and I thought back to this thing that happened with my father and grandmother, this tragedy that, that sort of befell them. And I thought, wow, what, in the world happened and how did they deal with that and how did it ripple through their lives and how, or how did they suppress it because clearly my dad was not you know it was not something that he was going to unpack for, at least for me and i'm not sure he ever unpacked it for himself so i decided to unpack it for myself and you know changed obviously the characters they're not my dad they're not my you know, my grandmother but um certainly the the central idea of a child sort of dealing with a kind of essential life uh, experience that changes the way in which they perceive the world to be. It, it was the driving motivator for telling the story. Um, and, and also I just, you know, uh, was the, this character of Miggy kind of appeared to me very quickly and easily. I mean, she was sort of herself fully embodied from the get-go, which is not the case with, you know, the other characters or most of the time when I write characters. But she was sort of there in the in the fullness of her irascibility and her um, her her rage and her anger and her um, kind of yearning and her sense of want, and um, so she was really the 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 character that compelled me through the narrative and through all the you know I'm sure there are some writers listening in, but you know when you hit those walls and you think how does this work? How can I make this work? What is this story? You know, why does anybody care? But she was sort of this, the energy of her, and it was, there was something kind of very essential to me about her, her burning desire to be in the world and the limitations that she had to suffer because of her age um, and, and, and the kind of energy and rawness that that produced in, in the character really compelled me. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, I'm wondering, cause I know you personally, and I know you happen to be a parent and I'm wondering if it's, your sort of insight into childhood with, um, cause it is extremely insightful is more from your own childhood or from parenting children? That's a really great question that I've never thought about. Um, I would say that it's probably both, but probably more inside me. I think that most of the characters that I write, um, they, there may be, there may be, a, a, attitudes or uh, gestures or even events that I bring into them from things I observe in the world. But I would say that they all kind of have to move through me in order before they get onto the page and I have to inhabit them. And so, I mean, I'm not an actor, but a as an actor would, you know, the act of inhabiting a character is sort of part, and part character and part you, right? Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of it had to do with some kind of drawing back to a sense of, of my own childhood. I'm, I wasn't Miggy, but I was, you know, um, but I definitely, you know, but the, but I, I have watched children so much, you know, just in the yard, in the playgrounds, in the, you know, and, and I think more than anything, it's the physicality of a child and the kinetic energy of a child that is, that was really, um, that I brought to bear. Um, on Miggy and even on the other little girl in the in the book named Ellen, who has a much different physicality, a much different pace, a different understanding of her position in the world. Um, but I think the physicality of children helped me a lot figure out how to write these children. 
That's great. I really noticed that they are like incredibly physical, especially Miggy's like kind of bouncing off the walls, but you really, you really go into the details of their physicality and what they feel and what they experience. Like even just what you just read about like walking on the records or breaking the records with kids. And it's so wonderful. And it really kind of brings back so many memories of childhood or, or step on a break, a crack, break your mother's back type stuff. You know, it really, you really embody the characters so well. And, um, I really love the difference between Miggy and Ellen and how those, cause I also had like a best friend whose family was very different from my family and going there was kind of like, oh, they like drank Pepsi. Like, we right, I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, like, the fact that they said a child, frozen, they had like frozen burritos that tasted really good. Like my mother would never like buy a frozen burrito. You know what I mean? So I love that. Like, funny whole, like, because children don't have a sense necessarily of, differences in the way that adults do, you know, in terms of maybe economics or, but they certainly pick out diff, this, the strange and, and whatever is strange to them might in fact be, a, have to do with those larger issues that they can't put language to. But I mean, I certainly remember, you know, friends of mine who, um, you know, they had, they had these living room, a living room that was just quiet and, and, it like the living room of Ellen, it was, it was unused. It was clearly, and that was not the way my house was. And so, you know, whatever that suggested about this family, it was certainly something that I picked up on, but you know, yeah, you pick up on the weirdest things. I mean, you know, what kind of juice glasses do they have? I mean, you know, and, and that's, but, and, and also the experience of being inside another person's home when you're a child is really I, I feel, I can feel it still, you know? Yeah. I mean, one thing about, you know, writing, writing children on the one hand seemed like, oh, this will be a, a snap because we've all been children. And, but in fact, it's incredibly difficult and it's um, uh, particularly difficult because they don't have the same kind of language and perspective um, running through their consciousness that helps us understand how they see the world. So we project a lot onto them, right? And, and I wanted to write children um, on whom I didn't project a lot of my own adult um, perceptions because I wanted to be right there with them. I wanted to be, you know, kind of at their level. So uh, it was the physical and it was what they notice and what they, you know, they, they feel in touch that helped me kind of remove my adult perspective from the situation and really just be inside of their experience of the world. Well, I thought you did it really masterfully. I've read things with children, uh, not necessarily even the protagonists, but, you know, that are kind of cringy, like, you know, they've just sort of this sort of this more idea, but I felt like you inhabited, like you say, almost like a, an acting exercise. Um, I really felt that so strongly from this book and I loved it. And I wondered when I was reading it, did you read a lot of like books with ch child protagonists as like your research? Um, you know, it's funny. I, I, when I write books, I tend not to gravitate toward the books that might be like my book because I want to write my own book, you know, and, and it can be somewhat daunting, you know, when you read, you know, to kill a mockingbird or, you know, Carson McCullers, you think, well, why bother? Right. I mean, you know, it, it was, but um, so no, I, so I didn't read those books as much as I actually read um, books about how children have been configured in literature sort of more scholarly books. I mean, I was at the New York Public Library, you mentioned this fellowship and I had the library at my disposal during the writing of this. And what I was really interested in was how, how do people think about the child's consciousness? You know, in a way, as a way of trying to almost teach myself how to remove my adult um, kind of frameworks and, and perspective from it. So I read a lot about how, how over time, how the consciousness of a child has been dealt with in literature and what people thought about children and their consciousness, you know, the Victor Victorian perception of children versus the, you know, the, the 1950s perception. I, I don't know. I found that a really useful way to sort of define for myself how I wanted to do it. Well, it's so interesting because also just sort of, you know, on the other side of the coin of that is parenting. And I felt like also it was sort of commenting on parenting, but parenting in a way is also how do you view the children? Because like Dr. Spock came out in the, I don't know, late right. 40s or early 50s. And then he said, you know, stop being so disciplinary and treat them as human. <laughs> and um, I wondered if 
kind of parenting ideas, because parenting is a big theme of the book too, for those who haven't read it, um, how those sort of historical parenting kind of changes played into your research or your conception of the story points as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the the first thing I had to figure re remember and recognize was that first of all, the the verb to parent and the idea of parenting, this was not as prominent in 1973 when the book takes place as it is now. You know, the kind of you know, you know, incredible focus that we give to that as you know, the job of parenting now is is a whole other ball of wax. I mean, the 73, I mean, you did have people like Dr. Spock who were obviously, you know, involved in that, but, you know, it, there was still a very, a strain of the fifties still going on in terms of the way children were perceived and the way parents thought of children. And even though the sixties had happened, you know? Um, so, so one thing I had to remember was that, um, you know, it, it, it's not, the parents didn't necessarily think of themselves as enacting parenting. Mm -hmm you know, it was a more reactive, I mean, I, and I'm going to speak about the particular parents that I configured because obviously I can't make a generalization about that, but you know, they, they were not schooled in, in parenting the way we, they didn't go to parenting classes, you know, and, and, you know, a lot of times people have asked me that, you know, did Mickey ha have ADHD or something is Mickey. And I, and I, you know, a no, but B um, the, you know, children were not in the same way medicalized, you know, people aren't, you know, every time a child has the slightest deviation from the norm, we're at the moment, we're quick to figure out, you know, what they have or what they, and in some ways that's fantastic because- And, can, and what medication to put them on. Yeah, and it can be great and it can be bad, right? I mean, it can be great if you're helping a child who's suffering and you can identify it and help them. And it obviously has its downsides too. But I think in 1973, for the people that I'm talking about, um, this was not what they were thinking about. And so um, in terms, so to get back to your question about parenting, I just had to think really specifically about my particular parents in the particular time and place where they were and what were, what were their, um, where did they come from and what did they bring to the table in terms of how they reared their children? Um, less, uh, more, less than, you know, what, what was the world of parenting at that time? Um, it's always, you know, for me in writing, that's always the key is to be as specific and as particular as possible with a character because you're not writing about parents in general. You're writing about some parents, all of whom are particulars, you know, have come from certain backgrounds, have certain their own pathologies or neuroses or 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 goals and dreams. And 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 it's much more valuable as a writer, for me at least, to just stick to the particular as, as close as possible. And I, and paradoxically, you know, the more particular you are, I think the more universal the, 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 the book is in a way, you know, I, I think it, it, you have to start from the tiny and, and it grows bigger. Yeah, I totally agree with you hundred percent. And I was going to ask you sort of about a broader sort of feminism sort of question as well, because that of course would been, have been an interesting time to have been a mother or they're, they're young mothers and they, um, you know, are sort of dealing with that in some ways, but it's in the background, it's not overt. And I just wondered how that sort of played into your conceiving of the two mother characters. Um, a lot actually. And again, I, I had to make sure that I was understanding their relationship to the times as these two particular women and not all women. You know, they didn't, they weren't representing anything. They were just these two women. And one of them is sort of more interested, engaged in this idea, in this, you know, new second wave feminism that is kind of at its, you know, most frothy in the, in the culture. Although, you know, in the place that she is in, in St. Louis and in the world that she inhabits, it's not, I mean, she's not on the front lines of marches or, you know, that's not her life, but she definitely has a sense that, the values that she's reading about, um, she she wants she's struggling to try to understand how she can make them actualize them in her life. Um, 
the other woman is not so much. That's not really what's what's driving her. I mean, you know, there were there were women at that time who were on on the cutting edge of all those you know feminist ideas and enacting them in their lives, and there were women who were really still very much in another era. Um, you know, the culture certainly hadn't, or society hadn't embraced all those ideas, um, and and in ter in terms of you know parody and all. I mean, we're still not there, but. Um, so, so it really was sort of how are these two women he hearing in the sh in the margins all this stuff? What, how does it affect their lives? And for each one differently, mm -hmm. I, I would say they definitely did affect their lives because yeah. the, the well, anyway, we can't talk about the <laughs> <laughs> overarching uh, way that the story flows. But um, it was very interesting to me because that would have definitely been part of the culture at that time. Um, you mentioned St. Louis, so I'm curious why St. Louis. Well, St. Louis, because I think, first of all, well, I'm from the Midwest and I spent my early childhood up until the age of seven in Ohio. And um, I think that just in a sense memory way, that's where my mind placed this story. I mean, there was no sort of over art. It didn't need to be placed in the Midwest, but I think just emotionally and in terms of my sense of my childhood and the air and the smells and the, you know, that's what, what came forth for me. And, um, but in fact, I, I have been married to someone for many, many decades who's from St. Louis. And so in, I've spent much more time in St. Louis in that area than I have in the place that I grew up, which I've spent relatively little time in as an adult. And so I've become very fascinated by St. Louis over the decades. I'm interested in its history. I'm interested in it visually. I'm interested in it, in, you know, sort of the, the human geography of it. Um, and so I, it just seemed a really kind of rich place for me to set the story. It was also sort of an interesting, um, you know, it, because the story is set in 1973, um, there's a lot going on in the country um, in terms of, you know, obviously, um, the war has, is kind of grinding to an end and there's this sort of, I think a sense of letdown, you know, I mean, obviously the war was, you know, not won and nor should it have been, but I mean, I think it, you know, the sense of, of loss and of, um, kind of why were we there? I mean, I think the vast majority of people by the time the war was over were against the war. Um, it was, you know, Watergate was happening. Um, so there was a sense of the mistrust of the government and, and the mistrust of the people who had dragged us through this. Um, there was in 1973, a recession. There were gas lines there, you know, that was a year that we didn't eat meat. And, you know, all the, yeah, um, so I think that, and St. Louis is a city that's kind of very visually in kind of post-industrial decline, or it certainly was then. Um, and, and so I think just as an over, overarching kind of, emotional and territorial geography. It, it was a city that seemed to sort of offer visually a kind of correlative for the emotions of, of the time that felt like the right backdrop for this story. Oh, wow, that's so great. That's so interesting how you attach the emotion part to it. That's so great. Um, you really get that sense that the place informs the story. It's not just pin the tail on the donkey. <laughs> yeah, I mean, place is a, you know, I, as a writer, I've always seen place as a, an emotional component. Like I don't, you know, choosing a place to me is, is an opportunity to understand the people, how they move through a place, how they feel in a space with weather, what the smells are, you know, that's a way of getting at character and each place is very particular. And so what it draws forth from a character is very particular as well. And so I don't, you know, I, I don't think of place as kind of a random, like, oh, I'll set it in Paris. It's pretty, you know? I mean, there's gotta be sort of an emotional connection between sort of the subtext of the story and the place for me to understand why it's there. And so do you go, did you go to St. Louis? Did you do research on St. Louis in the seventies or how do you like yeah. come up with all the wonderful details that you have? Well, I mean, again, I, I've been to St. Louis many, many times. Um, I, I uh, certainly did all the things one does, you know, you get the maps out and you get the, you know, you read the history and you read the, the newspapers of the time and, and, and um, just sort of tried to create for myself a sense of being in the space. Um, I used, you know, there, there's certain um, 
scholars who have written a lot about St. Louis, both in terms of, um, you know, the way the city developed over time, the city's racial um, kind of very interesting geography changes as, at, um, as a result of, you know, the kind of white flight and the racial stuff that was going on. Um, and that, still is going on. <laughs> and, it, and, you know, that's quite fascinating. And um, so I, I just kind of wanted to steep myself in, you know, what was happening at the time in St. Louis. Um, and visually, yeah, I mean, I drove around there and I decided where Miggy's house was and where Ellen's house was, where their schools were and where, you know, all those things were, um, just to make myself feel like I was in a space. I was in a, a real geographical space. That's great. I thought you really gave a sense of it. I'd never been to St. Louis and I actually thought it was really great. And you did get that feeling of like the town and then the suburbs and like driving back and forth. And you know, what's sort of interesting was when you, when you um, do that in fiction, you realize how very little it takes. You don't have to smother the pages with details of place. You just have to choose you have to figure out how your characters are in the place and what street they are on and what they're looking at and what what piques their curiosity about the land or the weather or you know it's raining and the windshield wipers have to, you have to pull over to the side of the road because of these sudden rain you know so those are the sorts of things that create a sense of place even though you're not kind of doing a an, an you know you're not painting the full portrait of a place yeah, and, and definitely you didn't have like stand back omniscient narrator. It was, it's really immediate. It's very in there. And I love that you use present tense. Why did you decide to do that? That was so interesting. I think I tried every tense. I tried every point of view. I tried, <laughs> um, it just was the one that, it, you know why? Because the past tense always felt to me to be a slight remove. And I, and, and, you know, you can do past tense where it's a very retrospective and adult telling a story of this is what happened when I was a child. And that felt completely wrong to me because it, it, it felt like this has to be experienced as it's happening to Miggy. And, and it's not about an adult who has already lived through this and has, as I, as we talked about this kind of sense of perspective and, and it, it, it sort of softened the, the, um, the roughness of the story to have it be told in that third person retrospective. And then even a third person close past tense. I mean, we're being very, you know, kind of writerly nerdy here, but I think a lot of writers okay. here. There's a lot of writerly nerdy people listening. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it still felt too far away. It still, I still felt like, no, I got to get closer, closer. And the closest I could get was, was to be in the present tense. I thought you really handled it really well, though, flipping back and forth between perspective. I mean, it was very seamless. You almost don't notice it, but you're in their heads uh, and you bounce around in different people's heads. And I thought that was really well done. And it was very, you know, you know, just immediate is just the word that I keep coming back to, you know, it's actually just something I had not done before. And I, I don't, I'd usually like stay really close to one person's perspective. And, um, you know, this is a book about two families and about how their enmeshment creates this draw, this tragedy and then the aftermath of it and what happens to them both as single families and also in their relationships. And it seemed, you know, utterly necessary to make sure that all, all of those experiences were alive at the same time. Mm -hmm. It was very, very well done. I really liked, I was sort of trying to look at craft, you know, to prepare for this talk and stuff. And it was like, the more I sort of looked, you know, got down with the microscope, uh, the more impressed I was with how um, fluid you could do it, but it even still bouncing around. And it, it's just really uh, an amazing book on many, many levels. And uh, how long do you usually take to craft your wonderful novels? Um, well, this one actually took about a year longer. Than, they, they've sort of been like three year cycles. This one was four for whatever reason. I mean, in some ways, you know, the story of this book was simpler than other novels that I've written. And yet it was, it, it was a harder nut to crack for me, I think, because what I realized, I mean, even though there's a central event, there's not a whole lot of plot beyond that. And so there wasn't a lot of plot to hinge on, you know, you, and, and then this happened and you suddenly have 20 more pages because you have to describe that. So it was really about how much deeper and deeper and deeper I could go into these characters, how much closer to the, to the bone I could get. And I realized with this book, there was kind of no shorthanding. There was no way in which, 
you know, plot could help me out because it, you know, what the, the great thing about plot is when things happen and characters behave, then you have a character, but in lieu of things happening, you know, you, you, you really have to just get closer and closer to the consciousness of your characters. So that was the challenge of this book for me. Oh, you totally succeeded in my humble opinion. Um, <laughs> so I just want to remind everyone that you can, um, put questions in the chat because I'll just blather, blather on and on uh, for hours. <laughs> um, so let me look, I don't see any questions so far, but one of my students email who actually, I think she's on here, Sharon, she's a wonderful writer. Um, she emailed me a question. So let me ask you that. So it's not all just me. She said, okay, <laughs> this is great. She said, is your novel based on one, imagination, two, life experience, three, man on the street interviews, <laughs> Four, data research, or five, all of the above? <laughs> um, all of the above, I think. I'm not going to forget them. But, um, you know, as we talked about, it's kind of, you know, it's a, based on a, an experience my father had. And then I guess, you know, uh, as a corollary to that, it's based on my experience of hearing that story. Um, it's based on, re, you know, research to the extent that I needed to. Um, uh, to understand the world that I was setting it in and to, to figure out, you know, small little things, what kind of trees are growing, you know, what, what do little people in a dance class for five-year-olds do, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and then uh, man on the street. No, not so much. I guess not man on the street. Interview. I've never, never really done that. Although, you know, as a writer, you're sort of, your eyes are open and your ears are open all the time and you're always listening and you're always hearing and, um, you know, absolutely, and I can't pinpoint what exactly, but things you see and hear come come into the world of your novel. That's just part of um, the pleasure of being a writer and and being that slight observer who's not, you know, who's always kind of taking notes in some way. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned when I was talking about Ricky Lee Jones' book that you were a filmmaker, and I know you were a filmmaker and a screenwriter in your past life. Yes. Um, and so I definitely felt the kind of visual sort of cinematic, you know, especially like the present tense, just for starters, uh, is something that you would, you know, work in in screenwriting, as well as kind of the flexibility you have with time, you know, you use editing sort of the main event happens, but you fast kind of flash forward, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, which I loved because it was like, what, <laughs> what happened? And you don't get back to it for a while without giving anything away, but that was very interesting choice. I thought well done for keeping us on our toes and wondering what exactly happened. And um, I'm wondering, do you feel, I have a theory about, you know, I think cinema really influenced novels of the past century and more and more as I, I don't read that many novels, but as I read them, I really see cinematic uh, influences. And do you feel like the cinematic, your cinematic background does influence your writing? Well, I think, I, I used to think it did more than I do now, which may just be because before I was closer to my experience of being a film director than I am now. So, you know, I feel like maybe, you know, influence of literature is, is way more prominent now for me. And I think that there, although there are certain things that are absolutely, you know, I keep using this word correlative, but, you know, there are, you know, in terms of, yes, the editing and how you move, move from scene to scene. I mean, and, and um, you know, visualizing, um, having action carry emotion is certainly part of the film uh, language. But I think that what, what's obviously really different is that in film, you don't have the opportunity to be inside the consciousness of a character. Um, the way we know people in film is through what they do and what they say and the face of an actor, which might help us, you know, or might not, depending on how good the actor is. But, um, you know, you don't, you don't hear their thoughts. Um, uh, maybe with a Godard film, you might hear in there. But, um, you know, so that's super, really, really different. And I think that literature is about, in some, on some ways, consciousness and, and, and um, the, the experience of being a, Con of a consciousness in in the world during in, in action while things are happening what's going on in the human consciousness um and, and although you mentioned time as being similar in some ways in some ways it's really not because i mean film is pretty much 
chronologically moving forward. You know, it doesn't normally have a lot of flashbacks or a lot of, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't play with time in the same way. And I would say that time is kind of um, the, the sub subject of every novel. Um, you know, how long a time you're taking to tell the story. You can have a scene that you move through really quickly. You've got a scene that you slow down with a lot of um, take, taking time to have thoughts, taking time to go to flashback. You know, there's a, a much different way in which time is malleable in fiction. So I think that I used to think it was more similar and now I think it's different. And in terms of this issue of, you know, how much is our books, I mean, I don't feel that the really great novels that I'm reading are uh, seem as influenced. I would say that maybe, um, I, I, I would say that great television is influenced by literature. I mean, you know, the, 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 the television that we all think of as, you know, some of the great series I think have a, we think we, I think one of the reasons we love them is because they have a literary quality in terms of how the stories spool out um, and, the, and the way in which they don't um, necessarily answer questions, but they continue to ask questions. Um, but I, I don't know the answer. I mean, that would take a big study to think about. I mean, that's, that's, that's a thesis right there, right? Somebody should write that thesis of whether literature is influenced by cinema. I mean, I certainly think that, you know, the kind of plethora of narrative that we're now just washed in, right? I mean, there's everywhere we look where we're, it's a story. It's, you know, on TV, there's a hundred thousand narratives. Um, that can be a little daunting, I think, for a writer, because you need to find, you know, t television narrative sometimes tends to sort of wrap it up in a way that I don't find to be particularly appealing in terms of novels. You know, what I'm looking for a novel is not an answer to a question. I'm looking for a question that just keeps getting more and more interesting. Mm, I love that. That's, that's fabulous. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's true that um, it goes both ways, definitely. I mean. Um, a lot of, you know, cinematic stuff is borrowed. I mean, like voiceover narration is like a cinematic attempt to be like a first person novel, like inside their head, which really movies aren't. <laughs> and it doesn't happen very much. You know, movies don't really do that. So, you yeah. know. Yeah, because yeah. it's borrowing from a literary tradition. It's not really using cinema for the most uh, right. effect that you can do, which is, you know, putting pictures, telling a story with the pictures, not with a, a soundtrack thing, device. Um, that's very interesting. Um, I saw a quote of yours on Wikipedia where it said, uh, more than anything, my teachers taught me how to read like a writer, how to understand how craft is used in others' work, and so begin to see how I might apply it in my own work. I think it's pretty hard to teach a person how to write, but you can teach them how to read. I loved that quote because I'm always telling my screenwriting students how they need to read tons and tons of screenplays. And I just wonder, do you read, not, I asked you before about if you read a lot of books with a child protagonist, but do you read other fiction while you're writing? Um, you know, I read fiction and I usually read it for exactly that, for craft. Like I'll think, gosh, I'm trying to find a structure that will work. This book that I is really interestingly structured. Let me see how the author did that and why and what it did. And, you know, what interests me about craft is um, not, not the randomness in the choice or that, you know, not style for style's sake, but how can you harness craft to help you tell your story, right? So a structure that you're choosing for my money should not only be an interesting stylistic structure, well, not, not at all. It should, what it, it ought to do is help you tell whatever the subtext of the story is. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, 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 do, I do read a lot for that. I don't read, as I said earlier, I don't read so much to find story that I like my story or, you know, how to tell my story. But I think about like, well, how did this person use the present tense, for instance, or what was the effect of the first person in this story? What was the effect of moving from character to character consciousness and not, not sticking with one point of view? Um, just to sort of teach myself as I'm going, you know, and to try to, to, to experiment with what choices I make that help me tell my story. You know, we talked about, you know, how the present tense was for me essential in kind of being as close to Miggy's character as possible so that the story could have a sense of her moment by moment 
um, Awakening, which this book is an awakening. It's a story about a young girl, you know, awakening into some of the mysteries and the inscrutable questions of life. And so the choice for Intense was about how to make that experience feel really present to a reader. That's great. Yeah. And do you find that that is one of the reasons why you like to teach because of these kind of discussions? Yeah. I mean, I, I love to teach for a number of reasons. I mean, I love to teach because I, it keeps me digging into thinking about these questions. Um, and I love to teach because I don't want to come to the end of these questions. I don't want to feel like, oh yeah, well, this is how you do past tense. I want to find out like, well, what else does it do? You know, I mean, the one thing I never want to do as a teacher is sort of deliver a set of, you know, aphoristic statements that I've, you know, written down 10 years ago and I'm still delivering. I, I want to sort of keep exploring the outer limits of possibilities so that my practice remains alive and changing. And, you know, I'm not interested in writing the same books over and over again in the same way. For me, it's all about how can I do something new and different with, with the tools that I have? So I love that. And I also love the community of it. I mean, writing is, is a solitary thing, which suits me, but I do love um, having the community that, that teaching invol uh, involves. And I love, the, you know, I love engaging with other people's work. It's really exciting to me to see, to help, to, to work with people and, and kind of figuring out what, what their intentions are and how they can best manifest that. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I have all the same feelings. And I, I don't teach how to uh, at the Muse. I teach workshop because I like when the students bring in their work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, how to, there is no how to. And, and you know, um, for, my, for my money, I mean, you know, there are many books about writing and some of them are quite amazing. But for me, only because they open up my mind and they make me think. But when somebody says, oh, well, this is how you do character. Well, I think, well, no. There's many, many ways. And there's many ways a character on the page comes alive. And sometimes it's through an incredible use of detail. And sometimes it's not at all. It might be the engagement with space that creates a sense of character. You know, different authors and different do it really differently. And that's, I think the pleasure is to sort of, you know, keep keep expanding the 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 ways in which all these crafts can be used. Mm -hmm. Do you map out your story at all, or do you let the characters sort of take you on a journey? Um, I don't map it because I have no innate sense of plot. It's just not in my nature to think, oh, and this is then going to happen, and then, then the you know third part is going to. I don't think that way, and I mean sometimes to my detriment. Sometimes I feel like it would be a lot easier. I generally feel like I'm sort of going step by step, and each step I have to stop and say, okay, then what? Then what? You know, which is kind of sometimes really challenging. But the other thing that I, I, I sort of have come to like about that, and I don't know whether this is just justification or not, is that, um, you know, generally I'm pretty surprised by where my books end up. And um, I think that might be because I don't map them out, you know, and, and I think the, the, the level to which I might be surprised might also um, be a way in which a reader might experience a certain sense of the unexpected or surprise, which is, you know, certainly, I, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to start a book knowing how it ends. And I don't want a reader to start one of my books knowing how it ends. Do you ever just completely get off track? And then you're like, ah, I got to go back to the fork in the road and go the other way. Oh, a hundred times. Oh my God. I always think about those wind up toys that, you know, you, you, you set going and then they hit the wall and then they fall over and you have to reposition them and then they go off. That's exactly how I feel. I feel like I hit walls and then I kind of reposition myself and then I go off another and hit that wall. And yeah, I mean, there's so many weird paths that I went down in the writing of this book. Oh, wow. <laughs> this one in particular? <laughs> All of them, but you know, this is the, the yeah. I mean, the whole, whole bizarre <laughs> kind of roads. <laughs> That's so interesting. I, I always am telling my students, like the first thing I say, and the thing I say the most often is you will rewrite so much and you will do every, you know, scene and if it's a movie 50 times, like get over it. You know, you just have to like understand that that's the process. And uh, I really beat that. Well, up. Writing, you know, it's like, I sometimes feel like I'm not really writing my book. I'm just sort of discovering it, you know, and it's, it's a, it's, if you can be in a mode where you think you, where you're not goal oriented and you're just sort of in the process of you know you're you're kind of excavating a book from or a screenplay from from 
your, you know, your mind, then that, that's kind of a, I, I don't know, for me, that, that creates more of a place coming from a place of fun and joy rather than, you know, trying to drive the car toward the, the, the goal and, and just trying to get there as, as quickly and seamlessly as possible. I, I think that's less joyful. There are less, many less joyful surprises in that experience for me. Well, you must have great patience to, to have that. I have patience. Are you kidding? <laughs> I mean, you know, we have these conversations. It sounds like I never have a day where I'm, 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 you know, miserable half the time. I'm second guessing myself constantly. I'm, you know, bemoaning whether or not this will ever turn out into anything. And, uh, you know, most of my friends who are writers will tell you the same. Um, you know, it's easy to talk about something after the fact, after it's been, you know, finished and put between covers and, but it's, um, you know, it's a really challenging experience to create something out of nothing as everyone on this, you know, Zoom, I'm sure is aware of. It's really hard. And it, it, it is, um, you know, you always think there's some writer that's, you know, just sits down and writes their book, but I haven't met that person. I mean, they existed. I feel like, we, kind of, yeah, we all have that dream that we're just yeah. going to sit down and write it perfect. You know, it's like, we just don't want to accept like all the pain and, and misery that's going to be along the road. Yeah. Um, okay. We're running short on time. So guys, if you have any questions, I don't see any questions. I don't know. Apple in the Q and A's are they? Oh, there is. Oh my gosh. I didn't click on that. Thank you. I was looking on the chat. Silly me. Oh. Okay. Win. Okay. He's one of my uh, students as well. Did your knowledge of what happened to your father help you understand him better? Oh, that's such a good question. And did that influence how you wrote the book? What a fantastic question that I've never even thought about. Um, I would say no, because I don't know whether, you know, I made this up. I made up my scenario um, and I have no idea, you know, my father's no longer alive, so I can't ask him. But um, I, I don't think I, I, I don't think I did. I think I, I invented people in lieu of understanding what, what would happen, what happened to my father and, and his mother around the situation. No, I think that the great, for me, the great um, frustration of, or I don't know, frustration is there's so much you never know about your parents. There's so much you never know. And maybe that's okay. Maybe that's okay. Excellent. Um, and then my other student, Sharon, who was the one who asked the other questions, said, do you write a pull you in or inciting incident in the first few pages in your novels? That's a good, that's a really good question also. Um, uh, I, I, I'd say the answer is no. Well, pull you in. I don't, I don't necessarily have an inciting incident. No, and I don't think of it that way. Pull you in is just um, a matter of, in, you know, for me, creating characters that are immediately curious and I'm interested in them and I want to know who they are more. I want to unpeel their, the onion of them. But um, I mean, you know, what I read to you is the first few pages of the book and it's really just about this inscrutable, irascible, um, energetic person. And so the degree to which somebody might want to continue to read this book has to do with their interest and curiosity about her. Um, so no, I don't really think about inciting incidents in that way. Um, uh, and, and, you know, it's funny, the one time I actually started a novel with not an inciting incident, but a sense of, of, of an incident having happened, a very dramatic incident that then I went back and the book then leads up to that incident. What I found was that people had forgotten that that happened, even though I tell them, it told them in the very first paragraph, exactly what happened by the time they got there, they had forgotten. I think they were just, you know, the, what, if they were involved, they were involved just because they were with the people going through their lives up to that incident. So no, I don't think of it that way. You know, I tend not to think about like, you know, you have to have the inciting incident, you have to do, you know, rule, the rules, no. It's really so much more intuitive for me. Yeah, it seems to be your work is more character-based. I've read a bunch of your novels and yeah. um, it's really focused on the character, which I love about them and not so much plot-based. Although some of them are more plot-based, I would guess, than others. Um, but I was just, I know a lot of my, um, students often ask about process in terms of the kind of business side. And so I was wondering how your, just to finish up how your, um, work with an editor and your publisher and how do they work with you on your project at the, after you turn in your draft? Um, well, 
uh, the editor, I could just talk about this one, the editor for this one, a, a wonderful one named Lisa Meyer, um, she had some really astute questions about that helped me focus on where there were weaknesses in the story. So um, she asked those questions. Um, she, you know, she, she would tell me the places where it wasn't quite on the page for her, what I, what I thought was on the page wasn't coming across to her. Um, editors work really differently. I mean, some editors will give you line by line by line notes. Some editors will give you more kind of general ideas. Um, some editors don't edit all that much. Um, I've been very fortunate to have editors who are very um, close readers and um, smart readers uh, and have offered ideas that change structure, have offered ideas that enlivened character, that toned down or brought up certain aspects of the story. So it's a, it, it really depends on the project, but, you know, I, I love an editor who gets in there, you know, and I'm, I'm happy to have an editor who, you know, is, is invested even in the, the, the word in the sentence. Um, so I've been lucky to have really great experiences in that way. Um, and the publisher uh, is, you know, then you go through the process of putting the book out and you work with the uh, the PR people and the marketing people and, you know, everyone does their best to get the book out there and there's certain, you know, uh, and then, and then it's up to the, you know, the, the gods you have, you know, you have control in terms of making sure that all the doors are knocked on in terms of trying to get the press and trying to get, you know, sales and all that. And then sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. And, you know, I've kind of, excuse me, come to think of it as being, you know, really thinking of my work as not e each book, not being um, its own thing, but I have a body of work, right? And so I try not to linger on whether this book did do well, or that book did well, or this one got nicer views, or this one didn't get nicer. You know, it's just sort of like, this is about me being lucky enough to have my explorations put in front of the public. And that just feels really um, lucky to me. And, you know, the rest of it is, you know, sometimes fun stuff happens and sometimes fun stuff doesn't happen. It's okay. <laughs> the it is Zooms. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, well, that is a perfect place to end, but can I ask one, there's one more question that just came in in the chat that came Absolutely. from that Susan put from Facebook uh, that we didn't get to is my friend, Jack, my dear friend, Jacqueline is listening in. Thank you, Jacqueline. Hello. Um, and she says, I am picking up on something you said about how the tragic event is not revealed at the beginning of the story. Did you play with where to reveal that part of the story? That is so, such a good question and so astute. And absolutely, yes, there was a time when the tragic event was within the first 20 pages of the book. And there was time when it was, you know, a little bit later. And then it, it sort of happens around the middle of the book. And um, <clears throat> what I realized is when it happened too early, I, I didn't know the char characters, the, we, the reader, and, and didn't know the characters enough to care. Mm -hmm. and, and I wanted them, in, in order for them to experience what Miggy experiences, they have to know those, the characters, so that the loss is a loss of someone they know. Mm -hmm. It's a loss, I've given it away. But, um, you know, not someone that they have heard about in passing, in which case it's you're not invested in it. So it was a matter of, you know, making sure that the readers were invested in the people to whom, and then, and then even the people who, you know, the, the people who had to respond to this tragic event, you know, you have to be invested in them in order to care how they how they react to it. That's what I felt. So yes, I would start out early and then it moved. I definitely think you were right. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very well placed, I would say. Great. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate it. It's just now eight o'clock. I don't want to take up any more of your precious time. And um, I really appreciate you're doing this for me, for the muse, for Norfolk Arts. And I really, uh, Hope that everybody goes out and buys the mysteries uh, from your local independent bookseller or bookshop.org um, and uh, supports Marissa. And please also consider reading her other works, which are all fantastic. Thank you, Diane. And thank you, everyone who is here. And it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining in. And hopefully we'll see you all at the next event. Bye.
Bye. Thank you, Marissa.